Hi, everyone. Hey, it's good to see you again. It is March of 2021. Wow, March of 2021. Uh, we've been thinking, as perhaps all many of you have been, about where we were a year ago in March of 2020. Hadn't it been something? What a year. I mean, we're all going to say that many, many times, and we're probably tired of hearing it, but it's no less so. We were struck um, as we were preparing for this particular update that this month's update represents our 12th update. We started in early April of 2020, and so this is our 12th one, and it made us think it would be a good idea to revisit sure. full ecology in general. Like, what do we know now that we didn't know back in early March of last year. Well, I think the year itself is prompting us to to constantly look at full ecology. Just the emergence of the COVID yeah. virus um, inviting us to take a look at what our relationship with the natural world is, the decisions we've made to really reduce or totally eliminate habitat, to punch roads into areas we've never been in before to uh, hunt and get bushmeat mm -hmm. for uh, bushmeat markets. Um, all of these things are really intensifying and crowding the relationships between humans and, and wild animals and making more possible the transmission of, uh, of disease like COVID. So that, that was something that... Uh, yeah, I mean, for sure. What, what we find ourselves up against is our unwillingness to live from our connection with all of the natural world because as we keep saying we are that and that has great meaning in fact yesterday we we're getting ready for this launch for the book which will be coming out on the on Earth Day the 22nd of April this year and we're having a virtual launch event keep your eye out for that um, working with this great team in Lake Tahoe to pull something together and came up with a title yesterday, it's working for now, that says uh, we are nature and it's never mattered more. Um, this what Gary's just talking about, part of it, full ecology has been for us a really useful and um, important coalescence of my background in social science and Gary's background in conservation science. Um, and when you look at what Gary just said about we are up against the consequences to human beings of the separate thinking that we've been engaged in, the dominance that we've been engaged in for, you know, 4,000 years, maybe more, but it's really, really intensified in the last 500. And the Piper's here for us to pay. Um, so how do we pay the Piper? Well, and yeah, if our treatment or, or lack of considered treatment of the natural world helped create a scenario in which COVID could emerge, how damaging COVID was uh, to human beings really depended a lot on how willing and able humans have been to act out of their innate genetic strength of cooperation and being, being with each other. The right. more we display cooperation, it seems that the better have been the results in the face of COVID. And when we decided May 1st, then something else happens altogether. Right. Right. We talk a lot about how we've gotten to this place, and it can get quite philosophical. And of course, there are obvious thumbtacks into historical moments. Um, one thing we know is that um, fascinating line of research that every time there's been a pandemic or even a significant epidemic in a particular geographic area associated with that have been riots of some sort, have been protests. And um, so what gets shaken loose is all of the lies that we're telling ourselves. Um, the lie that we are separate from the animals who are our relatives, from the forests that hold the animals that are our relatives, from the water itself, and from each other by virtue of our ethnicity, by virtue of our income, by virtue of our education. 
COVID has put it right in our faces that we are not. We are completely interdependent. And as is often the case in human experience, the folks who are paying most, who are dying most, are the folks who have been most affected by the way we're so out of balance with the natural world. You can check that for yourself. But, um, and, and, and when you do, check out intersectionality. And in fact, recently, leave it to social scientists to come up with clunky terms, but ecological, environmental, intersectionality, that's such a clunky term, but what that means is social justice is environmental justice. The people who have been most exposed to the pollutants and to the harm that's been done to this planet by mm, what technological advancement, by uh, industrial advancement for sure, um, are the folks who are dying most here in COVID. Everybody's vulnerable, but this is so. And in this country, half a million, we can't even wrap our heads around that. But if you know or know of any single story, each of those is a person with a life and a story, and each of those is intimately connected with everything else and finally with us. And I think there's a, a, a strong, if not resistance, at least confusion uh, on hearing what Mary just said uh, in, in many of us. Um, how does how really is social justice related to you know saving the earth? I, I'm not sure that's true. Mm -hmm. Well, consider and just investigate as we continue to try to do for ourselves how that confusion or resistance is itself a product of the kind of subject object separated thinking that we've been mastering for two thousand years, certainly the last five hundred years. We are so immersed in seeing things, in us being the subject and the world being objects, mm -hmm. that it's very hard to make the kind of holistic connections uh, as our uh, default way of seeing the world. And, and because of that, we're, we're living a very impoverished uh, life, I would suggest. And why it matters so much that we really get it, that we are nature, it's not just a cool idea. You know, and, and Gary and I have to admit, all of us the, are in some kind of process with that truth. Um, we, of course, are ourselves in that and are stunned at how deep the separation myth has hold of each of us and how quickly it can come to the forefront um, and we can find ourselves objective, in the objective gaze in ways that are harmful. Here's a good example of how the objective gaze really is a tool. You see brake lights in front of you, you put on your brake to avoid a car collision and possible damage to your body. Great use of the objective gaze. However, um, you look at a person who you size up right away, the story you wrap around them is, oh, they're one of those. And you color them invisible. Or you class them as somebody who's less than you. We are so prone to that. Rather than curiosity, we've been deeply, deeply so socialized into competition, into zero-sum thinking. And so that's part of why it is confusing to, to ask the question, what does social justice have to do with environmental justice? But the way we interact with each other and with ourselves, it makes more or less possible our stewardship of the natural world, no matter how much we care. Yeah, I think whether we're talking about social ecologies or natural ecologies, um, I, I love this uh, notion of, by Heidegger that when it comes to um, right action, if you will, in, in relation to the, the earth we live on. It isn't about saving the planet. And yet that's how a lot of us still see the whole climate change thing. We're, we're saving the planet. He suggested it was not about that, which really is sort of a subject-object separated perspective. It's about allowing the planet, allowing other lives to live out of their essence, to create a freedom to live out of their essence and to us to, and for us to live out of ours. That's a very different sort of goal than to come up with a uh, 
specific list of things that we're going to do to the, you know save a culture, save a, a, a planet. What is their essence? That takes a kind, a kind of a curiosity right. to, to even begin to answer that question. Yeah, so at first in the emergency room when someone comes in with serious symptoms uh, associated with COVID, the healthcare people are there to save that body, to save that form. That's what they're trained to do. That's what they can do. But it's finally toward releasing that person into their lives again to be and live that what Mary Oliver the poet calls one wild and precious life. And so the whole orientation towards understanding ourselves in the world as interdependent and so linked with each other that what we do affects how others' lives go, and same other way, the other way around, or always around, so that we are thinking first from our connection with each other. This takes, this is going to take generations of work for us to move our thinking back that way. On the one hand, for it to show up in policy, it can already show up in policy. Um, we, we tend to think that we have less of this than we do. We wouldn't be here with each other with this amazing little camera in front of us. We wouldn't have any of this stuff if there weren't a lot of co cooperation that went into making our innovations something amazing. So once again, our capacity to think in separate and incremental ways, that's a fantastic tool. If we put that first though, we override the heart of our connection with all things. And really, that's what we're dependent on to continue as a species. You perhaps have been hearing crows uh, talking in the background while we've been recording. One of the exercises that we enjoy uh, participating in is with every person, with every animal or creature like the crow, instead of just writing it off as, oh, that's a crow, it has these set of characteristics, really consider uh, on first sighting a crow or hearing a crow, that is a being that has a set of perceptual abilities and creative capacities that we have no sense of. Not only do we not understand them, we have no ability to mimic them because of our particular unique expressions and things that have developed uh, over uh, a long period of time in us. But we don't really know that crow. But we have to, if we think about it, ulti ultimately admit that's, that crow is a subject too. That crow has a world all her own that is expressing itself if we will but continue to give it the chance to do so. And the crow is contributing to the ecosystem in which she lives just as the ecosystem is sustaining the crow. So we have that circularity as well. I would say one of the things that has really um, continued to be highlighted in our conversations and, and has come forward during this year is that COVID and the pervasive social injustice being um, persistent and revealed, um, all of those things have brought forward this truth of how vital it is that we humans are right-sized, that we recognize our powerful possibilities for being, uh, you know, we talk about power with right, instead right, of power right, over, right. Yeah. Of, of stewardship. That's what we've, we've heard about it in the past. Uh, taking care of ourselves, taking care of one another and the planet that sustains us. So being right-sized in that activity is actually a far more um, relaxed and generative and super creative and it doesn't bar any innovation. It's just that um, we make decisions from a different place than that. Just watch yourself, we, we watch ourselves, it's, it's humbling um, how quickly you pop into the me story, what about me? Um, and, and just notice that and, and hold it a little lightly because we're really deeply socialized with that, but we can start catching it and making different choices. And that's part 
of being right-sized. There are some, uh, a few ecologists who have pointed out the notion in the natural world, whether you're talking about a, a lion or a wolf or, or, or some smaller, uh, more timid creature, there is a kind of compliance that uh, works in the natural world. And humans, ooh, I think we resist the word comp being compliant. That's somehow a negative thing. But there is a compliance with the reality of what our environment right. is asking from us or what it is asking from the wolf or the lion. And that's, um, that's something that we might consider on the path to becoming uh, right-sized. Yeah. What, what are we being asked to be compliant? Not in a negative way, but in an alignment way, in a harmonious uh -huh. way with the environment around. Very cool. Yeah, it's another way of thinking about cooperation, compliance, and innovate. Mm. I mean, uh, improvisation. Right, right. Because uh, compliance is just another way of saying, you wake up in the morning and you really don't know how the day is going to go. Even in COVID, if you think you know, you probably don't, and things are going to turn out different. If they have to be a certain way, you're probably going to be disappointed by the end of the day. And so our compliance is with taking what comes even when we don't particularly like it, but trusting that we have the skill and the support in the world around us, the belonging here as nature in nature, to discern the next step forward as best we can over and over and over again. Well, thanks for the last year of Full Ecology, yeah. and thanks to you uh, who have been with us on, on this journey. Very much looking forward to the next 12 months. Yeah. Uh, and count on them being completely different than any 12 that have come before. <laughs> That's the way it goes Improvisation, goes. another right. opportunity for improvisation. Yeah. We're going to be doing the deep dive that we do every month as well, where we open up. Um, there's going to be a link on our newsletter. Um, for joining with people who want to come virtually via Zoom uh, to go deeper into these themes that we're raising in this revisitation of full ecology here in the 12th month of our doing the update. So that deep dive is going to be the 9th of March at 6 Mountain Standard Time. So you can figure from there. And uh, if you don't get our newsletter and would like to, please go on our website at www.fullecology.com and go to the bottom of the, the home page where you can uh, subscribe. And that would be great. Also, feel, feel, please feel free to be in touch with us at connect by email, connect at fullecology.com. And Gary, you know that thing we mentioned early, about the launch it's coming up yes we're so excited this launch event this virtual gala as i think i like to call it a Mary gala launch it. is not enough it's really going to be a gala um <laughs> hosting the event is going to be no less than sister helen prejean author of dead man walking and the woman who's been so much in the news lately uh for her work and, and, and has been for a long time with the death penalty um, decades and the and the uh rather horrific uh, situation that happened the last couple of months of the uh, of the last presidency to rush to execute those who were on death row. Um, you might say, "Wow, such a Helen Prejean, uh, uh, death penalty um, uh, social advocate." To to stop that, what would what would she have to do with uh, full ecology? Yeah, and so when you think about it, I think this has been just a wonderful conversation. One of the most extreme expressions of our separate thinking in, potentially, in human experience is how we organize our response to people who commit a hideous act. How we organize ourselves and how we respond to that. This is a conversation. Uh, we, we look at those people and say, oh, well, that's not me. Well, it isn't you in form, but consider circumstances. Consider, uh, we spoke with a, a wonderful associate of Sister Helen's recently who said that she liked to remind people to think of what it would be like to walk around every day with a sign on the front of you that said your worst act ever. And that's who you were and that's how you were identified. So that's one way of thinking about it. But the social ecology of that is profound. 
How is it that we interact with each other around that most powerful question? So yes, please uh, put that on your calendar, April 22nd, uh, times to follow. Uh, but this uh, this launch is, is something we're uh, very excited about, and uh, we very much hope you'll join us. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be six mountain time again. Also, six mountain time but, again. But do really love that time. We'll we'll check in with you. All, All right. right, be in touch and happy March. And uh, yeah, there is more sunlight up here in the northern hemisphere, so enjoy that coming back on. Spring is on its way. Bye for now. Bye. See you next time.